The secret history of LSD is the story of the struggle between good and evil in the human heart. All the threads of life and death, virtue and virulence, hell, the deep journey from cosmic emptiness to the illumination of galaxies, are stored in the conscious reservoir accessible through LSD. Dr. Stanislav Grof called LSD a non-specific amplifier of the unconscious. It magnifies what is already inside us, magnifies the struggle between good and evil. Its extraordinary powers were discovered accidentally in 1943 by the Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman, who intended to create a new migraine pill out of ergot, a fungus that grows on diseased grain. Refined ergot had been used for centuries as a medicine, as a psychedelic mystery sacrament, and as a way to teach people the secrets of witchcraft. During the synthesizing process, Hoffman unintentionally ingested a small amount of LSD. He then took perhaps the most famous bike ride in history. The following morning he felt positively rejuvenated, saying, I had the feeling that I saw the earth and the beauty of nature as it had been when it was created. It was a beautiful experience. I was reborn, seeing nature in quite a new light. Despite such auspicious beginnings, he later called LSD his problem child, after the social uproar it caused during the late 1960s. But the secret history of LSD is not one of a problem child, but rather one of a wonder child whose awesome power amplified the timeless struggle between good and evil during the mid-20th century. And that struggle has implications today. The next moves we make are going to have a tremendous impact on the future of this story. What made LSD so attractive was the way it evoked what philosophers call mind at large. Mind at large represents every thought of every entity, human, animal, and extraterrestrial that has existed since the Big Bang, <laughs> and we are all hardwired into it. Accordingly, the human brain acts as a pressure valve which guards our consciousness against this total sensory overload. LSD eases that valve, allowing the very building blocks of creation to flood the mind. The obvious question arises. Who would control this awesome power? Various interests like the medical community, the CIA, and modern mystics all saw themselves as the true keeper of LSD's potential. Initially, LSD found a home in therapeutic settings, helping people sort out their innermost suffering, finding that bridge between mental hell and mental health. People lined up to take LSD. In fact, they demanded it. Treating these personal problems served as a way to nourish the larger society. LSD was going to heal the planet. One trauma, one anxiety attack, one depressive episode at a time. Many of the doctors giving LSD to patients also enjoyed the medicine themselves. For ages, intellectuals had sought a way to touch both the deepest parts of their being and touch the deepest parts of the cosmos. This principle has been articulated in many ways, but my personal favorite phrasing goes, as above, so below. LSD was the long-awaited celestial adhesive that bridged the holy heavens to the human heart. The very doctors who saw LSD as a medicine for their patients saw it as a metaphysical tool for themselves. But this duality, this above and below, comes with a sinister side. You see, sometimes the very tools of enlightenment, the very tools used for good, are used instead for abhorrent purposes. LSD offers one such example. Half a century ago, LSD was taken out of the mental health clinic and into the war room. The CIA sought to use the non-specific amplifier of LSD as a mind control weapon under a top secret operation called MKUltra. It was here where LSD revealed the true depths of depravity found in the human heart. MKUltra personnel felt that unsuspecting people would make the best targets and so they launched Operation Midnight Climax to secretly drug American citizens. Through Midnight Climax, the CIA funneled money to a man named George Hunter White, who used the funds to rent apartments in New York and San Francisco. 
He would then frequent the local bars and lure both sex workers and their clients back to the apartment to secretly dose them with LSD. He wanted to see if LSD could be used to put a person, a foreign leader perhaps, in a compromised sexual situation for later use in blackmail. Midnight Climax did not work out well operationally. Many of the dosed victims huddled in the corner of the apartment, too terrified to speak, let alone discuss sexual habits. They no doubt suffered long-term untreated trauma from the experience. George Hunter White had very little regard for the human devastation he caused with LSD, saying of this time, Sometimes when people had information, there was only one way you could get it. If it was a girl, you put her tits in the drawer and slammed the drawer. If it was a guy, you took his cock and hit it with a hammer. And they would talk to you. Now with these drugs, you could get information without having to abuse people. MKUltra also tested LSD on children, who were taken to secret locations where they were sexually humiliated and trained as assassins. One young girl abused by these trials later testified, They would perform radiation as well as mind control and drug experiments on me. I would receive intensive electric shock, isolation for days, sleep deprivation where they would attach electrodes to me, and if I started to fall asleep, they would shock me. She was 10 years old at the time. One of the doctors abusing these children was Wilson Green, who admitted, I like scaring them. They and the agency think I'm a god, creating subjects and experiments for whatever deviant purposes they can think up. MKUltra left behind a trail of human devastation and two deaths. Well, at least two deaths that we know about. The CIA found that they could not turn LSD into a weapon, so in 1973 MKUltra was totally abolished. With the question of an LSD weapon abandoned, more compassionate researchers started to ask new questions. Is there a consciousness out there in the universe? A supreme principle? Can that highest consciousness be reached through the byways of our own neural circuitry? Was LSD the key? Some LSD aficionados, like the author Aldous Huxley and the philosopher Alan Watts, thought, yes. They formed secret societies around the Los Angeles area in the late 1950s, using LSD in modern adaptations of ancient pagan mystery ceremonies. One doctor, who was also a part of this LSD society, stated, we saw ourselves as members of a consciousness clan that goes back through history to Eleusis and the Sufis and the Vedic Hindus. A different side of LSD was now being specifically amplified, not as a weapon or even a therapeutic medicine, but as a sacrament. To many who were working with LSD in this way, it sat right beside the wheel, fire manipulation, and toilet paper in the annals of great human achievements. Many saw it as a vital epoch in civilization. And so artists, mathematicians, homemakers, professors, and scientists all took LSD hoping to find the natural triggers of human evolution. This, of course, raised questions about the nature of God and the meaning of life. And so clergymen started participating in LSD sessions, blessing their psychedelic congregants and offering spiritual advice during the peak. An LSD-using Bible study group even formed in Palo Alto, California. All of this was eclipsed by the tumultuous 1960s when media manipulation, fear-mongering, and irresponsible use by unprepared explorers unfairly cast LSD into disrepute. LSD was eventually criminalized in the late 1960s, but its influence did not die. Instead, it went underground, planting the seeds that would one day blossom into the kind of culture that would accept it. Now this is where we come in. The secret history of LSD teaches us that LSD is not a magic bullet that guarantees love and enlightenment. Its awesome powers can be used just as easily for evil. But this comes with a bonus. By acknowledging our own shadow side, we can be more forgiving of others and build a more tolerant, less polarized world. Our culture is fractured, but perhaps there is an opportunity here. We are being given a chance to once again demonstrate the value of LSD and bring that secret history to light. 
as more and more cities, states, and countries decriminalize all psychedelic medicines, we have the ability to direct the fate of this non-specific amplifier. That is the magic we all have within us. So let's close our eyes and just imagine what we could amplify. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of After School. I'm psychedelic historian Thomas Hatzis. If you enjoyed the info presented in this video and you'd like to take a deeper dive into these topics, then please consider checking out my latest book, LSD The Wonder Child, The Golden Age of Psychedelic Research in the 1950s. Right now you can visit audible.com slash afterschool or text afterschool to 500, 500 and start listening to my audiobooks, all of which are narrated by me. So if you're interested in the secret history of psychedelia from ancient pagan mystery ceremonies to medieval witches, renaissance magicians, and the modern psychedelic renaissance, you can start listening now with a free 30-day trial from Audible and get access to thousands and thousands of all-you-can-listen-to audiobooks, podcasts, and original entertainment included in the Plus Catalog. Visit audible.com slash afterschool or text afterschool to 500, 500 Thank you so much for listening. Viva la psychedelic renaissance.